river rested unruffled, spread out in the tranquil dignity of a waterway leading to the uttermost ends of the earth. When the novelist Joseph Conrad was writing those words, one power governed a quarter of the world's population and covered the same proportion of the Earth's land surface. From the mouth of the Thames to the Bay of Bengal, it ruled the waves of all the world's oceans. The British Empire was the biggest empire ever. What greatness had not floated on the ebb of that river into the mystery of an unknown Earth? The dreams of men, the seed of commonwealths, the germs of empires. Thanks to the British Empire, I have relatives in Toronto, Alberta, Philadelphia and Perth, Australia. I even spent part of my childhood in Kenya. Nowadays, of course, the phrase British Empire conjures up images of chaps with stiff upper lips and pith helmets being waited on hand and foot by poor exploited natives. At best, it's a rather corny old joke. At worst, it's something we should say a collective sorry for. The Empire's sins tend to be better remembered than its achievements. Yet travelling the world today, you keep on encountering the living legacies of Britain's Age of Empire. It was British traders who united the world in a single capitalist economy, while British migration changed the face of whole continents. Protestant Christianity spread from Clapham to Cape Town. English became the world language. Western norms of law, order and government were exported too. And parliamentary democracy became the yardstick by which all political systems are judged. These are the pillars of the modern world. And if you like the modern world, you can't deny its debt to the British Empire. Today we live in a world dominated by a single superpower, the United States. Indeed, it sometimes seems a little bit as if we've become part of the American Empire. Yet Britain was the world's superpower for more than two centuries, exerting even more power beyond her borders than the US does today. First-hand memories of the Empire may be fading, but there's never been a better time to understand how Britain made the modern world. In December 1663, British pirates launched a smash-and-grab raid on the Spanish outpost of Gran Granada in the Caribbean. They fired a volley, overturned 18 great guns, plundered for 16 hours, sunk all the boats, and so came away. This is how the British Empire really began, in a maelstrom of seaborne violence and plunder. It wasn't so much the work of imperialists consciously imposing English rule on foreign lands, or even of colonists looking for a new life in a new world. These buccaneers, as they were called, were thieves in the business of stealing from someone else's empire. What they were about was not so much grand strategy, more like grand larceny. The buccaneers had a complex system of profit sharing, including insurance policies for injury. This was crime all right, but it was organized crime. The buccaneers leader was a rogue Welshman named Henry Morgan, a prickly hard drinking character who insisted he was descended from respectable Monmouthshire gentry. Henry Morgan was anything but respectable. Morgan was a gangster one of the generation of good fellows who laid the foundations of the British Empire. For Morgan, buccaneering was simply a matter of getting rich quick. But for the English government, piracy was a low-budget way of waging war. And the enemy was Spain. Not that the Spaniards were too worried by the English buccaneers. By comparison with mighty Spain, England was an imperial novice. 
By the time England acquired her first Caribbean bases, the Spanish Empire had been around for more than a hundred years. Spain was the 17th century superpower, and its empire stretched from Madrid to Mexico. By comparison, Morgan and his buccaneers seemed little more than an irritant, certainly not a serious imperial rival. But that was about to change. In 1655, the English captured Jamaica. They quickly set about supplanting the Spanish superpower. Thousands of pounds were spent on these fortifications to protect the harbour at Port Royal. To supervise the work, the government turned to Henry Morgan. So just a few years after his epic pirate raid, Morgan was now Deputy Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica and Commandant of the Port Royal Regiment. Once a licensed pirate, the freelancer had become a respectable colonial governor. Morgan's career was typical of the transformation of the British Empire. The British shift from piracy to political power was to change the world forever. But how was it that British pirates like Henry Morgan could lay the foundations of the biggest empire the world has ever known? It's one of the great questions of history. Why Britain? Why not Spain, Holland or France? Why not India? Why us? Fundamentally, it was a matter of economic style. The Spanish Empire was based on plunder. The British too started out as plunderers, but they went beyond smash and grab. Consider what Henry Morgan did with the Spanish silver he stole. He didn't take it home. Instead, he invested it in Jamaican real estate, in what is still called Morgan's Valley. Even a hoodlum like Henry Morgan could see that bigger money could be made from legitimate business. The point about Jamaica was that it was perfect for growing sugar. And here's the key to a fundamental change in the nature of British overseas expansion. The empire had begun with the stealing of gold. But the cultivation of sugar turned out to be far more lucrative. And that was because something quite extraordinary was happening back home. Seventeenth-century England was still primarily an agricultural economy. But though the wheel of change turned slowly, it turned nonetheless. More efficient farming and the first stirrings of the Industrial Revolution meant that the English were getting richer. Thanks to bumper harvests and iron bars, they could afford to indulge new and exotic appetites. England consumes within itself more goods of foreign growth than any other nation in the world. So wrote the author of bestsellers like Robinson Crusoe and Moll Flanders, Daniel Defoe, himself the son of a London merchant and an acute trend spotter. What he saw happening in late 17th century England was the birth of a new kind of economy, the world's first mass consumer society. And you only had to step inside the coffee houses of London to see what the English were consuming. This importation consists chiefly of sugars, of which the consumption in Great Britain is scarcely to be conceived of. Some people like to think the British Empire came about because of English individualism or the Protestant work ethic, but I sometimes think it had more to do with our appalling sweet tooth. During Daniel Defoe's lifetime, imports of sugar more than doubled, and that was just part of an enormous import boom because the English like to mix their sugar with an orally administered and highly addictive drug, caffeine, supplemented by an inhaled and equally addictive narcotic, tobacco. Sweet tea, coffee and tobacco taken together offered a dramatically different alternative to the traditional European drug, alcohol. If alcohol is a depressant, these new drugs were the 18th century equivalent of uppers. And these were legal substances that anyone could afford, as Defoe acidly observed. Plain country Joan is now turned into a fine London madam, can drink tea, take snuff, and carry herself as high as the best. Thanks to these new drugs, the English literally felt better. They soon looked better too. <laughs> 
Although there had long been English manufactured textiles, they were nearly all coarse wools and linens. What the discerning English shopper wanted now was altogether more exotic. Like the sugar, tea and tobacco the English consumed with such gusto, silks, chintzes and calicoes had to come from abroad. The result was nothing less than a fashion revolution. And again, Defoe spotted the trend. It crept into our houses, our closets, our bedchambers, curtains, cushions, chairs, and at last, beds themselves were nothing but calicoes or Indian stuffs. The wonderful thing about imported textiles is that the market for them is practically inexhaustible. Ultimately, there's a limit to how much tea or sugar any human being can consume, but people's appetite for new clothes had, and has, no such limit. In the early 1700s, there was only one place that could satisfy the English appetite for glad rags. It was the biggest economy in the world, with total output nearly ten times the size of England's. India. The fabrics, designs, workmanship and technology there were in a league of their own. All this time, the Spaniards were still empire-building the old-fashioned way, ransacking the wealthy civilizations of Central America. But when the English went to India, it was to trade, not to kill the golden goose. The economics of this early import trade were relatively simple. To begin with, English merchants had little they could offer Indians that the Indians didn't already make themselves. So it was a case of paying in cash rather than exchanging goods. Today we call it globalization goods and money crisscrossing the world to form a single economic system. But in one respect, 17th century globalization was different. Getting the cash out from England and the goods home again meant sailing 12,000 miles around the world. In the age of sail, the world was no global village. Merchants had to contend with storms, shipwrecks, not to mention pirates. The real threat, however, came not from ships flying the Jolly Roger, but from other Europeans who wanted to trade with India. Asia was about to become the scene of a ruthless battle for market share. This would be globalization with gunboats. The Hooghly River in Bengal was one of the commercial superhighways of the first age of globalization. In one direction, hundreds of miles upstream, lies the seat of political power, Delhi. In the other, the open sea and the monsoon trade winds back to Europe. So when Europeans came to India to trade, this was one of their preferred destinations. In 1700, the population of India was more than 20 times that of England. India produced nearly a quarter of the world's economic output. The sheer wealth of the Indian economy meant that Indian merchants had little interest in overseas markets. But it made India an irresistible honeypot for European traders. These dilapidated and incongruously European buildings are in the town of Chinsura, on the banks of the Hooghly. They mark the beginnings of one of history's most successful business corporations and its immensely lucrative relationship with the Indian people. It was called the East India Company. For more than a hundred years, it dominated the trade routes between Asia and Europe. 
But there's a catch. I'm talking about the Dutch East India Company, not the English. The Dutch East India Company was founded in 1602. The Dutch then were at the cutting edge of capitalism. A stock exchange, a central bank, a stable currency. It was an investor's paradise. And Dutch businessmen didn't just put their money in East India Company shares. They were also more than happy to lend to their investor-friendly government. Thanks to their system of national debt, the Dutch seemed able to conjure up money out of thin air. Now they could afford to send more ships up the Hooghly than anyone else. Backed by the Dutch Navy, their East India Company soon monopolized the immensely lucrative Asian spice trade. English merchants had in fact founded their own East India Company just a couple of years before. It was run from a rather smart boardroom like this. Yet in its early days it lagged far behind the more financially sophisticated Dutch operation. Despite the corporate splendour, it was an inferior imitation. Like its Dutch rival, the English East India Company raised money from the investing public by issuing bonds and shares, and was backed by a royal charter which granted it a monopoly over trade with the East Indies. Or did it? Because two companies couldn't both have a monopoly over Asian commerce. Year after year, the two East India companies sent ships south with the trade winds round the Cape of Good Hope to the Indian Ocean. From the start, English attempts to muscle in on the Dutch company's business led to conflict. The English fought three wars against the Dutch in an attempt to control the trade routes to the east. But the Dutch, despite having a smaller economy, could afford a bigger and better navy thanks to their sophisticated financial system. For the English, the cost of these unsuccessful wars was ruinous there had to be an alternative. There was a merger. Not a merger between the two companies, but a political merger. In 1688, a powerful group of English aristocrats, backed by the merchants of the city of London, invited the Dutchman William of Orange to invade their country. They called it the Glorious Revolution. The Glorious Revolution is usually seen as a political event, the final clinching of British constitutional liberties. But it was also a giant Anglo-Dutch business merger. Dutch businessmen were already major shareholders in the East India Company. Now their man, William of Orange, was Britain's new chief executive. The Englishmen who arranged this merger felt they needed no lessons from a Dutchman in religion or politics. They already had Protestantism, not to mention Parliament. But what they could learn from the Dutch was modern finance. A Dutch-style stock exchange was formed, allowing the government to borrow at much lower interest rates. Large-scale projects, like wars, could now be funded by a national debt. Equipped with these new institutions, England's larger economy soon powered ahead. The English became, in effect, the Super Dutch. Out in India, the company's agents were also copying the Dutch, acquiring trading bases, enterprise zones where they could safely do business by their own rules. The biggest was on the southeast coast of India. As if to advertise its Englishness, they called it Fort St. George. The town the English built inside the fort, with its church, its parade ground, its villas and warehouses, was like a replica of the Dutch settlement at Chinsura, but under the new Anglo-Dutch arrangement, Chinsura belonged to the past. The future was Fort St. George. The Englishmen who sailed east to work at Fort St. George were gambling not just health, but life itself on the chance of Asian riches. The trouble was that the company paid peanuts. The temptation to supplement its meager wages by moonlighting was overwhelming. It meant that the company was soon faced with a new source of competition, renegade employees. 
Typical of the young men on the make who entered the company's service in the late 17th century was Thomas Pitt, the son of a genteelly impoverished Dorset clergyman. India was to be the Pitt family's route from poverty to power. Pitt was a consummate trader, with both eyes on the main chance and his hand never far from the till. He had no desire to sit sweltering in the company's offices for next to nothing. No sooner had he arrived in India than Pitt went into business on his own. In doing so, he became an interloper, breaking the company's monopoly. To the company's bosses, Pitt was... A desperate young fellow of a haughty, huffing, daring temper that would not stick at doing any mischief that lay in his power. His later elegantly bewigged portraits mask Pitt's true character. Put politely, he was an operator. Put bluntly, he was a spiv. Whether they worked for the company or not, men like Pitt were crucial to the growth of Anglo-Indian trade. Alongside the company's official business, an enormous private sector was springing up. And what that meant was that the company's monopoly on Anglo-Asian trade granted to it by the Crown was crumbling away. It was probably just as well, because a monopoly company could never have exploited business opportunities in India the way the interlopers did. Indeed, the company itself gradually began to realise that the interlopers might be more a help than a hindrance to its business. At this stage, the English were merely parasites on the periphery of an Indian giant. It was from here, the Red Fort in Delhi, that the Mughal emperors, the lords of the universe, ruled India, a vast realm that dwarfed most European nations. The idea that the English might one day make the Mughal an offer he couldn't refuse would have struck a visitor to this magnificent court as preposterous. For the time being, keeping in with the Mughal Emperor was an essential part of the East India Company's business. Loss of favour meant loss of money. So from an early stage, the company had to learn to play politics. And that meant coming and paying diplomatic visits here, in the Diwani Am, in the heart of the Red Fort at Delhi. The Mughal Emperor sat right there on the peacock throne. Complicated treaties had to be negotiated with him. Bribes had to be paid surreptitiously to his officials. All this called for men who were as adept at wheeling and dealing as they were at buying and selling. In 1698, negotiations with the Mughal were entrusted by the company to none other than the interloper Thomas Pitt. Just as the pirate Henry Morgan had been called in to defend British Jamaica against Spain, so Pitt was to be the company's persuader in India. He was appointed governor of Fort St George. When the fort itself was besieged by the Mughal's local lieutenant, the company's directors back in London instructed Pitt to take the gloves off. These native governors have the knack of trampling upon us and extorting what they please of our estate from us. They'll never forbear doing so till we've made them sensible of our power. Pitt needed to get some protection. He began garrisoning Fort St George in earnest, raising company regiments from among India's warrior castes with British officers and the latest European weapons. Having started out in trade, the East India Company now had its own settlements, its own diplomats, even its own army. In fact, it was becoming more and more like a sovereign state. Rather smugly, it now called itself the Honourable East India Company. But these political pretensions were about to run up against a new and formidable foe. For centuries, the plains of South India were dominated by this fort. But by the middle of the 18th century, it wasn't held by Indians, nor by the Dutch, nor even by the English. It was in the hands of England's oldest and most tenacious rivals, the French. Mm -hmm. 
the struggle between the English and the Dutch had been primarily commercial. It was strictly business, a competition for market share. The conflict with the French was political. It would decide who would govern the world. It raged in every corner of the globe, even here in the ancient Indian fortress of Jinji. And its outcome was very far from a foregone conclusion. Today, the French system of education is one of the most centralized in the world. Everyone's taught the same syllabus, the same maths, the same literature, the same philosophy. It's an authentically imperial project, and that's as true here as anywhere else in the French-speaking world. The amazing thing is that this isn't Paris or even Perpignan, it's Pondicherry on the southeast coast of India. If things had gone differently in the 1750s, schools all over India would be like this. And French, not English, would be the modern world language. Pondicherry, one of the first French bases in India, was just down the coast from Fort St. George. But palaces like this look down on similar courtyards in Louisiana, Canada and the Caribbean. Think of it as a race for empire. At first, Spain had made the running. But the Spaniards had frittered away the loot from their conquests. Then the Dutch pulled ahead with their financial wizardry, but the Anglo-Dutch merger shared that advantage with bigger Britain. By 1700, there was only one serious rival left. And with an economy twice the size of Britain's, France was now the favourite to win the race. In the British press, there was mounting alarm. Every Briton ought to be acquainted with the ambitious views of France. Our trade, our liberties, our country, nay, all the rest of Europe, are in a continual danger of falling prey to the common enemy, the universal cormorant that would, if possible, swallow up the whole globe itself. Commercially, the French East India Company never posed much of a threat to the English. Despite massive government subsidies, it still managed to lose more than a third of its capital in just 20 years. Maybe that was because, unlike its English counterpart, it was under such firm government control. It was run by aristocrats, royal cronies, who didn't give a hoot about trade. What these men did care about was power politics. They dreamt of kicking out the British and turning India French. Anglo-French rivalry here and elsewhere led inevitably to war. The decisive conflict broke out in 1755. It lasted for seven long years. The Seven Years' War is one of those arcane conflicts beloved of a certain kind of dusty schoolmaster. You can almost imagine having to swat up the causes and consequences for some ghastly exam. Yet this 18th century Armageddon was every bit as much a world war as the great global conflicts of the 20th century. The fighting raged from Calcutta to Canada, from Manila to Madras. And what was at stake was nothing less than the future of empire itself. Would the world be British? Or would it, like Pondicherry, be French? The answer lay in Britain's shipyards. The Prime Minister William Pitt, the grandson of the East Indian interloper Thomas Pitt, ordered an enormous and expensive naval build-up. The Royal Dockyards became the largest industrial enterprise in the world. It was the first indication of the British ability to harness industry to the cause of empire. The Royal Navy doubled in size to a total of more than 300 ships. If you want a simple answer to the question, why Britain? It was the economy, stupid. The huge naval build-up was only possible because the British had something the French didn't have. Loads of money. Or rather, the ability to borrow it. The financial institutions copied from the Dutch at the time of King William now came into their own, allowing Pitt's government to spread the cost of war by selling low-interest bonds to the public. By comparison, the French were reduced to begging or stealing. So finance was the key. Behind every naval victory stood the national debt. 
The sheer number of British ships made a permanent blockade of France possible. By 1759, the Royal Navy was in a position to intercept and destroy the French battle fleet. But in truth, the French were sunk financially before a single cannon was fired at sea, because France was a bad credit risk. Like his Spanish ally, the French king was an absolute monarch with a reputation for not repaying his debts. So his government could only borrow at ruinous interest rates. This was the turning point for the French dream of global empire. Out in the French colonies, the effect of the naval blockade was devastating. With their supply lines cut, the French simply couldn't hold out. The capture of Quebec handed Canada to the British. The French Sugar Islands and the Caribbean fell too. And in 1762, their Spanish allies were bundled out of Cuba and the Philippines. That same year, the French surrendered the fort here at Jinji. By then, all their bases in India had been captured. The struggle for world mastery between Britain and France wasn't yet over. It would drag on with only a few intermissions until 1815. But the Seven Years' War decided one thing for sure. India would be British, not French. And that gave Britain what for 200 years would be the jewel in its imperial crown, a huge market for British trade and an apparently inexhaustible reservoir of military manpower. Indeed, India was more than a mere jewel. It was the whole diamond mine. In the aftermath of the British victory, the Mughal emperor was forced to cede vast territories, including the whole of Bengal, to the East India Company General Robert Clive. It wasn't quite a license to print money, but it was the next best thing. The deal gave the company the right to tax over 20 million people. The company was now in the biggest and apparently most respectable business of all the business of government. Once pirates, then traders, the British had won the European race for empire with a combination of naval and financial muscle. They now found themselves the rulers of tens of millions of people overseas, the majority of them here in India. What had started out as a business proposition had evolved through warfare into a matter of government. The question they now had to ask themselves was, how should that government be carried out? After all, India was a highly sophisticated civilization. The Spanish approach would simply have been to ransack it. But British rule in Bengal was to be more than a smash and grab affair. A new hybrid society began to develop. East India Company scholars translated Indian laws and literature. Company employees married Indian women and adopted Indian customs. It was an extraordinary moment of cultural fusion. In 1773, a governor general was appointed who was happy to encourage this mingling. Warren Hastings had joined the East India Company at the age of 17 and worked his way to the top. He was fluent in Persian and Urdu. And the more he studied Indian culture, the more respectful he became. Every instance which brings their real character home to observation will impress us with a more generous sense of feeling for their natural rights and teach us to estimate them by the measure of our own. This was more than just a cultural merger. In some cases, it was a genetic cross-fertilization, literally producing a new breed of men, genuine Anglo-Indians. The archetype was the grandson of the mayor of Montrose, but the son of a Rajput princess and one of the great warlords of the early empire, Colonel James Skinner. I think James Skinner is my favorite figure in the early history of Britain in India. He personified that Anglo-Indian encounter. He himself was of mixed parentage. He loved the women, he wore the clothes, he spoke the languages, and the regiment he founded, Skinner's Horse, was a quintessentially oriental outfit. There was only one part of Indian culture Skinner didn't buy into, and that was religion. Lying wounded on a battlefield, he vowed to found a church, and here it is today in the heart of Delhi. 
Men like Skinner believed that a permanent bonding of European and Indian culture was a real possibility. But this was to be not so much a merger as a takeover. The company's executives never forgot that they were in India first and foremost to make money. That was the bottom line of this private sector empire. A new word was about to enter the English language, a corruption of the Indian princely title of Nawab, the Nabob. It meant an Englishman who'd made a packet in India. Thomas Pitt was one of the first of these nabobs. When he returned from India, he built himself this elegant stately home at Swallowfield in Berkshire. As governor of Fort St. George, Pitt had found the perfect way to bring back the loot to pay for his new home. He called it, My grand affair, my great concern, my all the finest jewel in the world. This is a replica of his grand affair, the Pitt Diamond. At the time, it was the largest the world had ever seen. Pitt never told the full story of how he came by it, but it literally made his name. Henceforth, he would be known as Diamond Pitt. You might say he was the original Diamond Geezer. Wealth like this enabled him to found a dynasty which produced not one, but two British Prime Ministers. Yet the Nabobs could only make these enormous profits because the East India Company was maintaining a 100,000 men under arms, an army that was in a state of constant and costly warfare. What had started out as an informal defence force to protect the East India Company's trade had evolved into its raison d'etre, fighting new battles to conquer new territory to pay for the previous battles. What's more, the Nabob's prosperity also depended on the Royal Navy's ability to fend off the French when they returned to the fray in the 1770s, and that cost even more money. It was easy enough to see who was getting rich from the Empire. You only had to look at a place like this the question was, who exactly was going to pay for it? Empire didn't spell riches for everyone. Even as the nabobs were splashing out on their stately homes, most people in the British Isles were sunk in poverty with incomes little better than those in present-day Africa. A century of fighting France on land and sea increased the national debt by a factor of 20. But the interest on this mountain of debt was paid by hiking up the excise tax, which was charged, just as it is today, on purchases of alcohol and tobacco. It took a much bigger chunk out of poorer people's incomes than out of the vast wealth of the nabobs and it hit families in England and in Scotland too. The Union of England and Scotland gave Scots the chance to share in the profits of England's expanding empire. But it also meant they had to contribute towards the spiraling costs of what was now a British empire. Even in a place as remote as this, in darkest Ayrshire, the undertow of empire could be felt. This wee cottage is something of a national shrine to us Scots. It's the birthplace of Robert Burns, our greatest poet. Now, unlike many another Scot in the late 18th century, Burns isn't famous for martial deeds of daring do beneath palm and pine. But his life story sheds intriguing light on both the nature and the costs of the British Empire. Burns's poetry made him famous, but it paid few bills. So bad did things get that when he was 27, Burns thought seriously of emigrating to Jamaica. It turned out, however, that he could just as well serve the British Empire by staying put here in Ayrshire. This scrap of paper gives a clue as to how Burns finally made ends meet. Our national poet was a bit of a sinner, that much we knew, but what often gets forgotten 
is that he was also a tax collector working for the excise. And this is one of his tax ledgers. It was something that embarrassed him a great deal more than his celebrated boozing and wenching. I will make no excuses, but I have sat down to write you on this vile paper, stained with the sanguinary scores of they cussed horse leeches or the excise. For the glorious cause of lucre, I will do anything. As an excise man, Burns became a link in the great chain of imperial finance. Much as he deplored the unfairness of a system which supported the stately stupidity of self-sufficient squires or the luxuriant insolence of upstart nabobs. The enterprise of empire had become so all-embracing that it was able to co-opt even its fiercest critics. Burns was forced to keep his opinions to himself on pain of losing his job. Like the many other Scots of the period who worked for Hastings's East India Company and they dominated the payroll in Calcutta, Burns had been bought off. Yet the poor taxpayers of Scotland were very far from being the worst off subjects of the British Empire. The same drain of capital from India to Britain that made the nabobs rich also made the Indians poor. British taxpayers had to reckon with the excise, a government department. But more and more Indians now paid their taxes to the East India Company, and it was driven by the profit motive. At around this time, a Muslim historian by the name of Ghulam Hussein Khan began writing a melancholy history of his times. A former Mughal official, a general, indeed a go-between for the British as they took over Bengal, Ghulam Hussein lamented the drain of wealth from India represented by the Nabob's diamonds. Every one of the English holds it to be a divine obligation. I mean that of scraping together as much money in this country as they can and carrying it in immense sums to the Kingdom of England. These two customs blended together should be ever undermining and ruining this country. The ratcheting up of taxes coincided with a huge famine. It killed as many as a third of the population, some five million people. As the Bengalis starved, tax revenue dwindled. For the company, the only remedy seemed to be to fight more wars and collect more plunder. But these new wars proved much harder to win. The company's military overheads were soaring. Its profits were turning into whopping losses. Back in London, the shareholders were getting rattled. And you can see why when you look at this chart of the East India Company's share price. There's a bull market under Clive following the Seven Years' War, but under Hastings the stock tanks because of famine in Bengal and war. Things got so bad that the company's directors not only had to cut the annual dividend, they had to go cap in hand to the government for a bailout. The company got its rescue package, but the shareholders, who were well represented in the corridors of power, demanded a full guy. As the arch nabob, the East Indian fat cat, the Governor General Warren Hastings was hauled before Parliament and to his horror, charged with gross injustice, cruelty and treachery against the faith of nations. With various instances of extortion and other deeds of maladministration. With a wanton and unjust and pernicious exercise of his powers. This was more than just a backlash against chronic corporate sleaze. It was a return to the imperial drawing board. Up until now, the empire in India had been run as a purely commercial operation. Yet under Hastings, profits had turned to losses. Was it time for the government in London to take over? In the end, after seven years of legal wrangling, Hastings was acquitted, as fat cats usually are. But the system he represented was not. The days of Nabob rule were over. Like many another rogue corporation, the East India Company would henceforth have to answer to a government regulator. The supreme irony was that the Prime Minister who cracked down on the now not so honorable company was William Pitt, the great grandson of that notorious Nabob diamond pit. From now on, governor generals in India wouldn't be company traders, 
but aristocratic grandees, appointed directly by the crown. When the first of the new governors arrived in India, he took immediate steps to clean up the company's act. This palace was the new Governor General's residence, in the heart of what had become the capital of British India, Calcutta. It's a telling symbol of what the British in India now aspired to. Sleazy, money-grubbing Orientalism was out. Virtuous, high-minded classicism was in. By the late 18th century, the newly reformed East India Company was just one of a web of British corporations that together dominated the global economy. From Hudson's Bay to Botany Bay, from Bengal to Barbados. But now these companies were becoming, in effect, agencies of the British government. The globalization of British profits had become the globalization of British political power. If ever an empire was built on economics, then this surely was it. The British had ended up with the biggest empire the world had ever seen. They had robbed the Spaniards, copied the Dutch, beaten the French, and plundered the Indians. Now they ruled supreme. No one had consciously set out to do it. Indeed, the Victorians later joked that the empire had been acquired in a fit of absence of mind. But the last thing the British suffered from was absent-mindedness. They knew exactly what they were doing, and they meant to keep on doing it. When James Skinner died, he was buried in the church he had founded in Delhi. And his descendants continued to be buried alongside him right down to the end of British rule, nearly 150 years later. This is one of those countless corners of a foreign field that will be forever British. It's a striking reminder of how a people who began as buccaneers became traders, then soldiers, and then rulers. From piracy to power, in just three generations. <laughs>